This project is supported in part by an award from the National Endowment for the Arts on the web at arts.gov. What do you think about when you see a painting hanging on a wall? Why does it appeal to you? Who made it? What was the artist thinking? What makes this painting or this drawing worth seeing 100 years or more after it was created? This is the story of an American artist, Milton Herbert Bancroft, who started his career during the nation's Gilded Age. He studied and worked to develop his talent, struggled to establish a career, made some sacrifices to work at what he loved. This also is the story of preserving Bancroft's work so that we can see it and appreciate it today and well into the future. The University Museum acquired the core of its Milton Bancroft art collection in 1978. It was through the efforts of Dr. Barbara Balsiger, who was the art history professor here at the time, and she also was instrumental in starting the museum a couple of years earlier. Uh, she had her own home in Maryland, and she heard about the Bancroft estate sale and arranged for the foundation for IUP to purchase art and memorabilia from that sale uh, on behalf of the university. Since 1978, the museum has acquired additional Bancroft art through gifts. These include mural studies for the Panama Pacific International Exposition in 1915, and also drawings he made in the French war zones at the end of World War I. Some of the paintings came to us with varying degrees of damage because they'd been stored in a barn. We had water damage, we saw mouse nibbles, there were pigeon streaks across some of them. Um, we didn't know as much about conservation then as we know now, and in the, in the time since that acquisition, we have found out about new techniques, new products have come on the market. There is much more intensive study and preparation for conservators these days. We just know a lot more about conservation and how to do it properly than we did at that time. We've really only been around as a, as a kind of academic field with serious training programs. 40, 50 years. Prior to that, it was very much a craft. It was an apprentice sort of thing. So you went and you trained with someone, um, whether it be in paper or paintings or whatever, and it was really a craft. And now it's becoming a little bit more of a science. We understand what the consequences are. Sometimes when paintings are maintained like that, in families, this will happen in families, you gotta put stuff somewhere so it gets stashed up. And you'll see all sorts of you know, problems from wildlife. There'll be spider damage and fly damage and mice, um, worm damage. They like to chew the, they don't like the material so much, they like the adhesives, they like the glue in the canvas. But, but these paintings didn't really have any of that damage. They had this structural damage, this sort of planar distortion from having been taken off the stretchers, taken out of tension, and folded up and just stored any which way. The idea for the Bancroft Conservation Project began as we were moving uh, our database from an old pin feed system to uh, Pass Perfect, the new database system that we use now. We were able to examine every single piece and enter new information into the database. And as we did that, of course, it gave us an excellent chance to see that we had a lot of uh, his work that really needed conservation attention. This particular collection is a wide variety of things because the artist was working in a lot of different media. So Milton Bancroft uh, was working out in the field at times, so some of the things that he did, like pinholes in the top of paper, would have been so that he could um, potentially pin it to a board or something out in the field when he was working out in the field. So some of the damage that we see with uh, objects in collections like this are not really damage per se. They were created by the artist at the time that he was making the work, and so that's not something that we would fix all the time. We, we may leave those sorts of things to show the artist's working method. Uh, but then there are other issues with these pieces, most of which have to do with um, matting and framing. And that's very common in paper-based collections because paper is more fragile. It tends to be displayed in frames behind glass with mats. And until maybe the last 20 or so years, the materials that were used 
for matting and framing were not the best materials. And people didn't really understand what acidic paper, bad tape, different glues, those sorts of things were actually doing chemically to the paper itself. So a lot of what we would be doing with this particular collection is undoing bad matting and framing. So not something that the artist did, but something that was done afterwards. A grant opportunity arose through the National Endowment for the Arts. We applied and we were awarded funding for conservation first, but then an exhibition of his art and of some of the memorabilia that's in special collections. So we actually have his life as an artist with this collection because it's such a vast comprehensive collection over such a wonderful period of time. Milton Bancroft loved mixed media. So we have all these wonderful, wonderful pieces, uh, graphite, pencil, charcoal, pastel, watercolor, crayon. He loved to do many, many drawings with this mixed media. And uh, also paintings, wonderful paintings. I wish I could say there's one medium in which he excelled, but I think I would frankly have to say all, because they're all so actually beautiful in their own way. Milton Herbert Bancroft was born on January 1st, 1866, in Newton, Massachusetts, the middle of three children of William and Martha Varnum Bancroft. Not much is known about Milton's childhood, but by age 15, his interest directed him to the Massachusetts Normal Art School in Boston. After a challenging four-year course of study, Milton graduated in 1886. Within months, he was teaching art and mechanical drafting at Swarthmore College near Philadelphia. He found its Quaker values and intellectual life compatible and thrived as a teacher there. He was a teacher as well as an artist. He actually did uh, teach his students, and of course he studied as well uh, at the academy, the classical style. So of course he shows this in a lot of his drawings, this very classical style, this accurate proportions, as we'll see in the one piece, uh, as we see as a man uh, for a study of a mural that we have, a pencil drawing, which is on a grid. Uh, that grid is to help um, be able to have the accurate balanced proportions in a figure. And this idea and concept goes all the way back to ancient Greece and Rome. And then of course we get it again, it's rediscovered in the Renaissance by such artists as uh, Leonardo da Vinci and his Vitruvian man, which man is a measure of all things. And Milton Bancroft was very good at this and you'll see that in so many of his wonderful, wonderful uh, figure drawings that we'll see here. But this grid, of course, uh, Milton Bancroft uh, did these large, huge murals in the San Francisco Exposition. And with those murals that he did, of course, he had to take a small drawing and he had to put that into a large painting. So to do this, this grid helps an artist be able to do that. It helps them to create proportions and balance and take that and then recalculate those measurements and put them on a larger piece. Take them from a smaller piece to a larger piece. While teaching at Swarthmore, Bancroft plunged into Philadelphia's art scene. He joined the sketch club and freelanced as an illustrator and picture editor. He also attended evening classes at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. The Pennsylvania Academy was the first museum and first art school established in the United States. It was an important training ground for painters and sculptors. In Bancroft's time, the faculty and courses were firmly set in the academic tradition established by Thomas Aikens, who had studied, taught, and ultimately directed the school until 1886. Thomas Anschutz, Thomas Hovenden, Bernard Yule, and Alexander Sterling Calder were among the instructors while Bancroft studied there. Fellow students included sculptor Charles Grafley and painters Edward Redfield and Robert Henry. As a second year student in 1888, Bancroft won a Topin Prize for a painting in the Academy's annual juried exhibition. In 1892, Bancroft left Swarthmore and joined the Academy faculty, teaching classes in drawing from casts. His fellow teachers included Anschutz, Grafley, and Robert Vono. Bancroft also served as superintendent of the Academy school. He managed student enrollments and scheduled instructors and models for art classes. At Swarthmore, Bancroft had met a young woman who shared many of his ideals and artistic interests. Margaret Moore came from a distinguished Maryland family with deep Quaker roots. Margaret Moore and Milton Bancroft married in June 1893 at Margaret's family home, Norwood. 
Determined to develop as an artist, Bancroft resigned his position at the Pennsylvania Academy. He and Margaret sailed for England in September 1894 and proceeded to France. In Paris, they settled into an apartment at 65 Boulevard Arago in the Montparnasse district, their home for the next three and a half years. Since the 1860s, American artists have been drawn to Paris to study at the private art academies and build their reputations exhibiting at the Paris salons. Among the most prominent were the academies Colorossi, Delacluse, and Julian. Bancroft studied at all three, with the French artist Georges Callot, Gustave Courtois, and Paul-Louis Delance, Auguste Joseph Delacluse, and Louis-Auguste Giraudot. Outside the Academy studios, there were museums to visit and exhibitions to enter at the Société des Artistes Français. Bancroft sketched in the bustling Paris streets and in its parks and museums. When you think about the time um, that Milton Bancroft lived, and you think of this time during which he's doing his art uh, during war, you know, during World War One, we're looking, you know, uh, 1918. We're looking along this period of time, and you know, it hasn't been that long in the late 19th century. The French Impressionists uh, are so popular, so you can see that he picks up a lot of these concepts: this loose brushstroke, um, this getting the moment, this day-to-day -day life, moment of action. And you can see this in so many of his uh, drawings. You see that he's trying to encompass everything that's going on. So you can always see there's that touch of realism still there. It, it, it's still there in his figures. It's, it's still there in his proportions. But you do see a lot of that impressionistic style. And he's experimenting with it. And he's really you know, learning about it. And he's doing a great job of it. And I'm sure being in France didn't hurt either. <laughs> Bancroft traveled to other scenic parts of France, such as Carteret on the Normandy coast. He also visited galleries and museums in Belgium and Holland, where he especially admired the Dutch masters. Occasionally, Margaret traveled with him. The Bancrofts found a refuge in the picturesque village of La Mothe saint horé southwest of Paris. In September 1896, the first of their three children, John, was born there. This painting was actually in the the sort of the next to, to the last <laughs> bad condition uh, because it had been so badly folded and creased. You can see that there was up in the top areas up here, really in the middle, it may have been just folded over in the middle at one point, uh, a lot of damage down along the bottom. There was this great big crease down along, this diagonal crease down along the bottom. So it had just really just been flapped and folded when it was taken off the stretcher. So this painting was sort of, uh, as far as the color layer goes, it was kind of in the poorest condition because one thing that Bancroft did, this is 1905, so it's a little bit earlier, this is kind of a more, this is a much more classical, it's almost like an illustration style. It's a very thin color layer, and especially up in the top portions, he literally almost just sort of stains the canvas with his oil medium. And one thing that's bad about that is the, uh, the natural solvent for oil paint is turpentine, which you probably used. The more you, you put that into your paint layer, the more you wash out the adhesive capacity of the medium. So what happens down the road, now it's probably not going to happen to this painting. What happens down the road is the paint doesn't have the adhesive capacity potential that it should have, and you'll start to get some powdering and flaking and dusting over a period of time. In May 1898, the Bancrofts returned to the United States. By June, Bancroft was alone in New York City, ready to launch his career. Margaret and John remained at Norwood in Maryland. That would be their primary residence for years to come. New York City in the Gilded Age was surpassing Philadelphia and Boston as a cultural center and mecca for artists. Bancroft struggled to establish himself artistically and financially. His first studio, near Union Square, doubled as living quarters. Fees from illustration work for McClure's Magazine, Harper's Weekly, and other popular journals barely covered his own frugal living. He could not afford to support his young family in the city. At Norwood, Margaret struggled to keep up her own spirits and Bancroft's. They exchanged frequent letters. She wrote of the stress of living poles apart and keeping alive young John's memories of his father. Bancroft was frustrated that his dependence on illustration work for income limited his painting time. The IUP Special Collections and University Archives collects, organizes, preserves, protects, and provides research access to over 300 archival collections 
including Manuscript Group 133, the Milton Bancroft Collection. The Milton Bancroft Collection is housed in 11 archival boxes and organized into seven series that include correspondence, photographs, newspaper articles, business documents, and memorabilia from the 1880s to the 1940s. The largest component of this collection is the correspondence between Milton Bancroft and his wife Margaret and their children John, Tom, and Anna, as well as other family members and close associates. Bancroft's correspondence reflects his relationships with friends including architect Henry Bacon and sculptor Daniel Chester French who collaborated on the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. Uh, I think between special collections and the University Museum, we probably have the most comprehensive collection of Bancroft art and memorabilia in any single institution. The Salma Gundy Club in New York was an important center where artists could socialize and exhibit their work. Bancroft was elected to membership in 1904. In his free time, Bancroft visited exhibitions there and in other galleries meeting fellow artists. A commission by the Park Bank of New York for portraits of its directors was an important break. Bancroft was earning a reputation for fine portrait painting. Although Bancroft exhibited his work in Philadelphia, Chicago, and other major cities, New York was his base. He entered exhibitions of the National Academy of Design, which since 1825 had defined fine art in America. In the early 1900s, the Academy shared exhibit space with the Architectural League of New York and other artists' associations. In that setting, Bancroft's paintings gained a wide audience. The Architectural League was founded in the 1880s by architects and artists in allied fields. The League elected members of professional prominence beyond New York, such as Louis Comfort Tiffany, prominent sculptor Daniel Chester French, and his frequent collaborator, architect Henry Bacon, were members. French's protege, sculptor Evelyn Beatrice Longman, was a frequent exhibitor, although women were not members at that time. Bancroft was often commissioned for architectural decoration projects. Painted murals and ornamentation were common in public buildings and the homes of the wealthy. Popular motifs for murals were allegorical scenes with classical subjects. In 1906, Bancroft entered his first Architectural League exhibition and was elected to its membership the following year. In 1908, Bacon, Longman, and Bancroft won the League's special prize for the best design by an architect, sculptor, and mural painter in collaboration. Their collaboration in this and later projects set the stage for Bancroft's most visible professional achievement. San Francisco, 1911. Preparations were beginning for the Grand Panama Pacific International Exposition to celebrate Balboa's discovery of the Pacific Ocean and the opening of the Panama Canal. Prominent American architects, painters, sculptors, and landscape designers were selected to carry out the ambitious theme for the exposition site. Many of these professionals were members of the Architectural League of New York, including Daniel Chester French and Henry Bacon. Bacon, the appointed architectural commissioner for the exposition, also designed the Court of the Four Seasons there. Evelyn Longman created a central focal point for the court, the Fountain of Ceres, while other sculptors' works decorated bays and columns. Bacon selected Bancroft to paint 10 murals for the court. In addition to literally hundreds of letters and photographs, his archival collection contains select artwork, including studies for murals that he painted for the Court of the Four Seasons in the 1915 Panama Pacific International Exposition in San Francisco. In the court's four bays, one for each season of the year, a set of two paintings would illustrate the tasks and the pleasures of the season. Two larger panels located in the court's half dome would portray art crowned by time and man receiving instruction in nature's laws. In New York, following the exposition's great success, Bancroft felt changes on several fronts. Modernist currents unleashed in the Armory Show of 1913 were making an impact on art circles. Demand slackened for portraits and architectural murals. Continuing conflict in Europe drew American artists' attention to the plight of France, where so many of them had studied. Bancroft joined the American Artists' Committee of 100, formed in 1914 to raise relief funds for French artist soldiers and their families. By 1916, 
The United States was preparing for possible entry into the war. American artists created posters promoting industrial preparedness and home front support. The War Department, the Navy, and the Red Cross also commissioned posters for their recruiting efforts. Bancroft designed several posters for them. His archival collection chronicles Milton Bancroft's life and the events that surrounded him, including World War I. As the United States entered the war, Milton Bancroft wanted to serve his country by utilizing his artistic talents for the war effort. His wartime correspondence with colleagues, government agencies, and military personnel, including his own son, 2nd Lieutenant John Bancroft, show Milton Bancroft's desire to create posters, teach, and serve in Europe. In 1918-1919, he would be an artist with the YMCA detachment based in Paris, France, where he documented the World War I in sketches and paintings. Early in 1917, Bancroft wrote to the Council of National Defense in Washington, I am extremely anxious to place my services at the disposal of the country. He applied to several wartime service offices. Assignment overseas as a camouflage painter or as an artist in the field with the Army was briefly a possibility, but his age disqualified him. In May 1918, the Bancroft's oldest son, John, enlisted in the Army and was sent with a company of engineers to France. Milton Bancroft intensified his efforts to serve in some capacity overseas. By autumn, he was working with the American YMCA in France, overseeing the design of relief stations for American soldiers there. Bancroft's work took him from supply ports to Paris to the frontline sectors of St. Quentin, Chateau Thierry, Reims, Verdun, and Argonne. He also designed posters promoting the YMCA's support of the American soldiers in France. After the armistice, he made sketches of conditions and daily life in the war zones. So this next piece by Bancroft is a poster, or it's the original art for a poster, that was done for the YMCA, again, while he was in France um, during the end of the First World War. And you can see that there's some lines here, some pencil lines here that uh, were helping align all of the text, uh, whether or not he did the text, I'm not sure. But um, certainly this could have been photographed as it was and produced as a poster. Uh, the border is there, um, all of the text is there. So this would have been reproduced for mass consumption as a poster and um, looked pretty much like it does as an original piece of art. The YMCA stations sometimes served as emergency hospitals for liberated French prisoners of war. Bancroft wrote of one such episode, you never saw such a ragged army of misery, one-armed, one-legged, one-eyed. He went on to describe the efforts of local citizens and his own staff to feed, clothe, and care for them. Late in 1919, Milton Bancroft and his son John returned to the United States. Bancroft brought back more than 200 drawings from the war zones in France. In 1920, 40 of them were exhibited at the Corcoran Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. Several of these are part of the Milton Bancroft collection in the University Museum. Uh, like I said, the quick brushwork. Uh, in his uh, colors, you'll see that too, because it's about color. I mean, if anything, the Impressionistic influence, it is about color. It's about bright color. It's about the color at the moment. It's the way light reflects off an object, uh, off a scene, that every day to day life, the motion. And it comes, you know, and, and actually there's even an influence for them too that goes back to uh, the 17th century Dutch artist when you're kind of getting away from that history painting and you're getting more and more into that every day to day life and what's happening. And Milton Bancroft captured that. What is happening here in World War I? What is going on? And he did it, you know, marvelously. So, you know, he's very important even as a historical artist. You know, uh, because he's actually documenting, you know, many things of World War One. His year in the French war zones had left him longing for a quiet life. In 1920, Bancroft closed his New York studio and retired with Margaret to Norwood in Maryland. 150 years after his birth, we are preserving this artist's remarkable legacy. IUP's University Museum in collaboration with IUP Special Collections and the University Archives, 
will present an exhibition in the University Museum. It features the artwork of Milton Bancroft and his archival collection, framing these in historical context with the world events that impacted Bancroft, his family, and his associates. The exhibition is co-curated by Donna Cashdollar and Harrison Wick, and it showcases some of Bancroft's works that have been professionally conserved. That conservation and the exhibition are partially funded by a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts.